Critics have said about Michael Brecker that his musicianship is pro the strongest in the last decade, maybe the strongest influence since John Coltrane. I know that you'll be amazed and enjoy his musicianship, but I think you'll also see a very personal side of Michael and a very quiet side, honest and very sincere. Please welcome Michael Brecker. start off just playing a tune and uh, maybe I'll talk for a while and uh, and then uh, play a little more and then find out what you know what you all have to say okay let's just play blues the B flat I guess one two one two uh, uh. <laughs> Thank you. 
Kind of a funny situation because uh, I really feel like playing. It's great musicians. You know, this is fun. Well, but the whole point of me coming here is partially to talk. I think you know. Uh, nah. All right. Well, we'll split the difference. We'll split the difference, and uh, you know, uh, I'll tell you a little about my life, I guess, and uh, and what I'm doing right now, and uh, then we'll play a little more and maybe take some questions. Okay. I'm not used to having a, there's no microphone here to bend down. <laughs> this is on one TV, hello. Uh, I'll run through a brief history real quickly. Uh, I was born in Philadelphia. I came from a musical family. Uh, everyone in my family plays some instrument or another. My father's a pianist. My mother's a pianist. My sister's a pianist. Uh, 
I play a little piano. <laughs> and uh, when I was a kid, I thought everyone was a musician. You know, it was the kind of family I grew up in. <laughs> you know, uh, it was a shock to me to find out that that we were kind of an oddity. Uh, I began on clarinet at a very young age, and uh, played it not too well. And uh, was more interested in sports, really. My first influences were uh, that I can remember were Clifford Brown, and. Uh, uh, Jimmy Jufri. I remember learning clarinet solos for, uh, off of Jimmy Jufri records when I was about six years old. I used to play into a uh, to a garbage can for reverb, you know. And uh, I had a little gold wastebasket, and that's where I practiced. You know. And to this day, I still love reverb. You know. Uh, whenever I do an album, they always have to turn my echo down in the mix. You know. Uh, I switched to saxophone after hearing Cannonball Adderley play um, and began to take it seriously, I guess, in, uh, in, in junior high school, uh, also playing basketball. That was my major pastime. And I started playing professionally, really, in high school. Uh, I started listening to a lot of Coltrane and, and was playing with a lot of musicians that were older than me. And uh, I studied privately, which I generally always did and still do. Uh, and I played a lot around Philadelphia and eventually went to Indiana University initially to be a music major and uh, I switched my major at the last minute. This is my, one of my moments of rebelling. I realized that I had been playing music half my life, half my life uh, partially to compete, you know, or to, for my parents' approval, you know, because that was the way my family was. So I switched. I was at Indiana University and I switched to pre-med. <laughs> It's a brilliant decision. And there I was stuck out there in, in pre-med, and uh, that wasn't working too well. So I tried fine arts, you know. And meanwhile, all the time, all I did was, uh, was spend time in the music school practicing. And my fine arts teacher, I, I had some talent in drawing. I, I became friends with one of my teachers, and he uh, just told me to move to New York <laughs> and play music. So... <laughs> He, he, he dropped a subtle hint. Uh, so I did that. I moved to New York when I was 19. And uh, my older brother, Randy, uh, was, had been living in New York uh, for about two to three years at that point and was, was playing beautifully and, and starting to work quite a bit. He, he did really well very quickly. And uh, he was very nice to me when I went there and introduced me to a lot of people. And uh, I didn't have to scuffle real hard. Uh, because I did have some connections through him. Uh, of course, I, you know, I scuffled for, uh, for a couple years. Uh, but I always managed to work. I, I just took any gig I could get. Uh, uh, you know, any kind of weird rehearsals that didn't pay anything, you know. And I always was fortunate to meet people, you know, particularly at the weirdest rehearsals. That's where I met some, sometimes the people that became most important uh, later on. Um, I also, you know, continued to, to study privately uh, with various people. I tried all kinds of, I studied the Schillinger system and, uh, and uh, took some lessons from Joe Henderson and, and studied with Joe Allard, who uses me as an example of what not to do on the saxophone. And uh, <laughs> uh, am I uh, walking off camera here? Where's the camera? Ah, there's the camera. Uh, I, at that point, uh, I, I neglected to mention, I guess, that I'd always been playing rock and roll and R&B, you know, uh, in Philadelphia. I grew up listening to Ray Charles, and uh, I'd always been, uh, you know, listening to AM radio, much to the dismay of my parents, you know. And uh, so I began, you know, I'd really getting into, into uh, rock music in, in college and, and was very serious about it. Uh, and I, I really listened to a lot of blues and studied that idiom and uh, checked out a lot of guitar players. And by the time I moved to New York, it just happened to be that kind of timing where there was a kind of a, a, a need for uh, horn players that, that uh, uh, wanted to play on records that, uh, that could play something other than bebop, which I also was able to do. Uh, so I started getting some work uh, on some albums and uh, I 
I formed a group with my brother and some other people called Dreams, and we uh, did some recording for Columbia. Uh, the records were an amazing failure. They were great musically, but uh, they didn't sell anything. But we did get a reputation in the business uh, as a good horn section, and Barry Rogers was playing trombone with us. So we started doing dates, a lot of dates as a section, and uh, uh, I continued doing other things, playing a lot in the lofts in New York and jamming a lot and uh, just trying to stay active. Uh, after Dreams broke up, I went with Horace Silver for, uh, for about a year and a half, and that was uh, one of my favorite gigs uh, ever, because that was like going to, to college for me. You know, I really, uh, really worked hard. I practiced a lot during that period, all the time, you know, before the gig. I don't know how I did it in retrospect. I had a lot of guts. I always, you know, make amazing noise in the hotel rooms and get complaints. And uh, I really wanted it, you know. So I uh, stayed with Horace, and uh, after that I went with a myriad of different groups. I played with Billy Cobham for a while, and then my brother and I uh, formed a group called the Brecker Brothers, and uh, I made a bunch of albums for Arista Records, and, uh, and continued to, you know, to tour a lot and practice a lot, and just uh, uh, also do record dates. Uh, right now I'm playing... Uh, uh, in a group called Steps Ahead. We just did another album. Uh, we finished it a couple days ago. Uh, and that should be out in a few weeks, believe it or not. And uh, I'm studying composition presently and uh, pr working pretty hard on that. Uh, and I'm working around New York and I play on Saturday Night Live every week, which is fun. Uh, and. I'm drawing a complete blank. What else did I want to say? Uh, I'm going to throw it up and open to questions in a minute because it, it's hard to talk to a, a whole group of people not knowing really where where uh, you know everyone's at a different place. I mean, it's silly for me to talk about harmony and 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 improvisation because that's real well covered here. This is really the best music school in the world, I think. Uh, and. Uh, you know, I guess I'm not really here to talk about that, but I'll, you know, if anybody has any questions about that. I use a Selmer saxophone. Uh, <laughs> and it's a Lavaz medium reed. Uh, and uh, this happens to be dying, this reed. Uh, and the mouthpiece is presently a Dukoff, D9. And uh, I'm, not suggesting that, I'm not suggesting that uh, all saxophone players use this. This is what works for me. Uh, everyone is different, everyone hears differently. Um, the only suggestion I can make is go for what you hear. And, uh, and if possible, try not to let anyone sway you. You know, if you're looking for a sound, uh, stick with it, you know, unless it's really obviously not working. Uh, I know uh, when I switched to this, I had been playing a different setup for a long time and I had to switch because of some physical problems I had and I found this setup, and I liked it a lot. And a lot of people in New York, a lot of the saxophone players, told me to not not to use this. And now, pretty much all of them are, are using the same thing. <laughs> so, uh, so I kind of learned a lesson from that. Uh, you know, I just have to go with with what I think sounds good for me, and uh, you know, and hope that that, that it's okay. Uh, Boy, I made this list of things to talk about. I don't really feel like looking at it. So maybe uh, uh, if you feel comfortable enough to ask some questions, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, to answer them the best I can. You know, does anybody want to put something into the air? No. Hi. Yeah, on the uh, heavy metal bebop album, the song called "Funky C Funky Do," you do that free jazz thing. Now it sounds like you're playing two saxophones. What is actually happening there when you do that solo? Uh. What was happening was that I was playing electric saxophone. Oh, okay. And at that time, I was using a real cheap, uh, kind of a cheap effect, you know, cheap thrills. Uh, <laughs> there really wasn't much I could use when that was the, in terms of elect electric uh, things. And the times have changed quite a bit now. But at that time, I think it was called a frequency analyzer. And it cost $40 or something like that. And I push a little button. And uh, I found a good use for it. It was kind of limited, but I found a couple things that I could do that enabled me to play chords uh, and play along with it. And I think I was using a, 
uh, an envelope follower and some, some other things. You know, I, I say they're cheap gimmicks, but actually the trick is, is figuring out how to use them so they sound, you know, so they sound good. Thank you. Yeah, um, the question is, why did I listen to guitar players? <laughs> uh, I did because I liked the way they played. <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, I was looking for other I mean, pretty much my playing is generally mimicking other things that I've heard, you know. I'm not tremendously original, you know. I just, I listen to things and then I learn them or I hear them enough and then they get into my psyche and then I distort the hell out of them, you know. <laughs> and uh, what, what I was doing then was just, I loved, I was very excited by guitar players, uh, particularly around in the beginning in the late 60s and uh, and, and early 70s, it was just, there was a whole excitement happening on the instrument, you know, the way they bent notes and, and the way they played the blues. And, uh, and I really, uh, I liked what they were doing, so I, I tried to, uh, I figured out weird fingerings on the saxophone to emulate, you know, the way uh, they would bend notes and try and get in between the major and the minor third, you know. And, uh, and I, was, I was just lo experimenting, looking for other avenues, you know, I still, you know, I, I don't just copy saxophone players, although I, I still love to copy saxophone players. You know. uh, if I hear anyone play a phrase, you know, if it really gets my ear, I try and figure out what it is, you know, or find a record that it's on and, uh, you know, slow it down if I have to and, and figure out what it is. Uh, you know, I think it's a real useful tool also, you know, to, uh, to learn solos or learn parts of solos. Uh, I know that's a question that's often asked me. Did I learn solos? And uh, the answer is yes. Um, but I, I didn't have the discipline to learn whole solos, really. I did it occasionally, but uh, I found it helpful for me to, if I was going to do it, to copy it out myself uh, and not do it out of a book because I, somehow it sank in more. And uh, I also found, found it helpful to, once I learned it, to play it along with the record to figure out how it lays over the rhythm section. Um, but more often I took pieces, you know, guitars or saxophones, and, you know, trumpets, piano solos, and, and if I heard a lick that I like, I'd, I'd steal it, you know. And uh, eventually, I mean, my memory is not so good, so I'd forget it, and it would come out in some other weird, bizarre way a few months later. I, I found that it was usually two months. If I worked on something like two months later, all of a sudden it would creep out. I'd be playing somewhere, and all of a sudden, you know, that would come out. And, uh, you know, it was never really a conscious process. I was never one of those people that could learn something and then play it that night. I just, I always have to trust that it's gonna come out somewhere in my psyche. And uh, it's, it's, music for me is largely intuitive. Uh, I was talking about that earlier. I'm not a real intellectual kind of player. Uh, my mind doesn't work that way. I think fairly quickly. I'm aware of the chords when I'm playing most of the time. I'm not real tuned into that. Uh, Lately, I've been more tuned into shapes and pivot points and uh, uh, melodies, uh, particularly when I'm recording. I've been trying to concentrate on playing melo melodically and less, less mechanical, playing looser, uh, and just let you know, what naturally happens happen you know, without trying to color it. Um, I wanted to do this. I was thinking about this early. Maybe I'll, I'm just going to, this is a risk. Um, I was talking also earlier uh, about time, about rhythm. For me, I think the most important thing is, is time. You know, I don't know the word to use for it, swinging or cooking or, you know. Uh, without that, it doesn't matter what notes you play. Notes are important too for me, but uh, if I'm not somehow really connected in a meaningful way to, the, to what's happening in the rhythm section, it, it really is pointless, you know, in jazz music you know, or jazz-related music. Uh, I don't know how to quite... I've never done this, I just want to, this, I don't know. One way I worked on it was to play the, was to play the drums. I was wondering if I could just... This could be real embarrassing. Can you lift your seat a little bit? Just lift, thanks. Thank you. Over the coffee, right, thank you. 
bear with me. I haven't done this in quite a few moons. Mm. Wanna just do uh, blues again, do the same. Just, well, just to play a couple quarters, play for a minute, and, see. and then I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Around the, I guess the same <laughs> tempo. <laughs> so we're working. Oh, yeah. What? Oh, do you want to turn it I did that, I guess, just to show that I'm serious, that, you know, that for me, rhythm is the whole thing. I'm real attached to the drums. Uh, I don't play it too often anymore, but, you know, when I was younger, I really sat down and tried to figure out how three goes against four, you know, what makes music swing. And then uh, from playing with a lot of saxophone players, I used to play drums a lot with saxophonists. They used to like to play with me because I knew where they were coming from. And uh, it was like the reverse side of the coin, you know, I, I suggest, you know, I mean, it's just a suggestion if anyone wants to learn more about that, just to take up a, a rhythm section instrument and, uh, you know, screw around with it, and it's amazing what you learn. Uh, I don't know why I did that, but... Hi. You yeah. said you Yeah. Uh, no, I've been thinking about it uh, lately. Uh, the question is, do I still st or do I study saxophone privately? Not presently. Uh, I took a breathing lesson last week on, from a trumpet player. Um, a lot of times, I you know I, I you know I end up getting together with saxophone players, and a couple times I ask people for, ask people for lessons, and they they don't take me seriously, you know. Uh, but uh, I've been thinking of trying to get back with Joe Allard a little bit, also. I don't know. Thank you. Hi. Uh, who is and where do you study composition? I study with a guy named Edgar Grana, who teaches at Juilliard in New York. And uh, it's a kind of expansive thing. It's going to be, you'll, I'll probably be there for a long time. And uh, part of it's just psychological approach, you know. It's, it's interesting. Thank you. Hi. Huh? Talk more about that? Uh, it's kind of hard um, to talk about exactly. I don't know. It's composition. It's giving me some basic tools. Uh, we're going to start working on string writing soon. Uh, right now, he has me working on. Uh, it's going to sound ridiculous. Erzatz lines. It's twelve tone writing. You're making a matrix out of uh, out of a melody, and then. I don't know how to explain this exactly. Uh, uh, getting uh, voicings from the matrix. And uh, it's a whole other way. It's just another way of thinking for me. I'm used to, to, to chords and, uh, and notes, you know, and lines. And uh, it's just a way for me to, it's another tool I've been using, you know, just trying to voice lines uh, using kind of a di different system, using this guy's system, you know. Remains to be seen if it's going to, you know, help me a lot. But I've, I've written a couple of compositions on that, based on that approach. Does that help at all? <laughs> Hi. How, how did you like a, a cow piano? 
Uh, the question is, how did I like working with Hal Galper? I, I liked working with Hal Galper. Uh, he's a great pianist, and uh, that was a chance to play a lot in an acoustic setting, because I was playing with uh, Brecker Brothers a lot, totally electric, and I needed to, uh, you know, I get crazy in either way if I get too much one way or the other, so we, we did quite a bit of playing acoustically, did some touring, and made uh, a few albums. Uh, and he's a wonderful pianist. Thank you. Yes, I'll get over there. Too. What's yeah. the rehearsal schedule for Saturday Night Live? Uh, real, the, the question is, what's the rehearsal schedule for Saturday Night Live? And it's a very, very uh, hard gig. I, I, uh, it's a tremendous test of will and, and, and patience and persistence. I, I get there at Saturday morning and rehearse from 12 to 1. And uh, then I show up for the gig. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Occasionally we do, uh, we do a pre-tape. Uh, most of the playing we do on the show is, is doing the commercials, you know, and we play the theme and the closing theme, and uh, it's just, it's fun. It's fun. Uh, it's a fun job just to, uh, to watch what goes on in the studio, and it gets really crazy, and I, I enjoy it. Also, uh, there was, last week, sorry, uh, last week there was a guy who played a solo with the Stray Cats, and it wasn't you. Oh, that was a rerun. That was from a. Uh, uh, I don't know his name. He's uh, uh, he, he was good though. That, <laughs> what? Huh? No, he was with the group. He was with the Stray Cats. Oh, he's with the Stray Cats. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I really, I really didn't get to meet him. Uh, that particular show though, that was a rerun. We did a skit with uh, with Eddie Murphy uh, playing James Brown in the hot tub. And, uh, and uh, there's two things that I don't like to do that I always get embarrassed. One is go to the beach, right? And, uh, and the other one is dance. And both of them, I'm real. I always, I do them, but I'm queasy about it, you know. And uh, my friend was my first show, you know. And what did I have to do but get dressed up in a bathing suit and dance? <laughs> Hi, the back. Um, throughout the series so far, we've had very negative degrees of comment on today's contemporary fusion. Obviously, I think we know possibly how you feel about it, but could you elaborate on that? And also, do you consider it jazz? Uh, I think it's ballsless fusion tripe. No, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, that was from a review of uh, Brecker Brothers. That's what, no. <laughs> uh, in fact, that was a review of Brecker Brothers. We weren't even playing on the album that they reviewed. They uh, they just singled us out for some reason. It was uh, uh, my I guess my only comment is that I'm uh, I don't know, I never liked the word fusion. First of all, I mean that, there was a kind of a fusion sound happening in the in the late seventies. You know. Um, Right now, all I can say is I'm real excited by what's happening uh, in the whole kind of techno world. Uh, I know it freaks a lot of people out. Uh, a lot of horn players and rhythm section people get paranoid because they think uh, that the machines are going to take over, you know. And uh, I really find that, uh, for me, it's a state of mind. With, uh, with steps, we're really working now with, uh, with a lot of synthesized sounds and, and a sequencer and, and drum machine, and we're trying to work it into the music. Uh, and and we're, we've been really considerably su uh, successful. I'm real pleased about it. Uh, I said earlier, it's like, all of a sudden for me, it's like playing in Technicolor instead of black and white. We had a, we had a sequencer playing behind us. And uh, I don't know, it's a tough question to answer because it's, you know, it's so general. I mean, there's so many kinds of music and there's so much good music happening, you know, and some not so good. And uh, I really don't think that the issue is, elect is electronics, but the people who are playing it. You know, uh, I don't know, I guess that's my answer. You know, thank you. Hello. In your album, Cityscape, the Plaza Underground, was that a neat challenge? Was that a good project? Uh, yeah, the, the question was, uh, was the album Cityscape with Klaus Ogerman a challenge? Uh, it was a challenge, yeah. And uh, I, I loved the album. I really am very proud of that album. Uh, 
uh, there was, I don't know, that was a real unique experience. I hope we do it again. Um, Klaus Ogerman is, is a really is a really unique kind of arranger. Uh, next time we do it, I'd like to spend more time. We did it fairly quickly, and uh, and the music was difficult, particularly the chords that he writes. You know, I really what I did was I just threw the chord sheets away, you know, and used my ears because I couldn't figure out what the heck. It, you know, he'd write the chord, and then the strings would be playing something really bizarre. So I really I had to. Uh, throw the music away. What I tried to do also, you know, was leave some space in some of it, you know. And, uh, I don't know, that was, a, that was a great experience. Thanks. Hello. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit how, about how you used to practice? Like, sure. Yourself, yeah, all, all of the above, everything you mentioned. Uh, I practiced, um, with a metronome, I've never been real good on discipline. I, I hate to say it, you know. I know I'm supposed to stand up here and say, well, you know, practice, 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 discipline, you know, eight hours a day. Uh, I've always gone in spurts. Um, I have at times used a metronome on two and four. I get depressed when I do it because I rush, you know. Um, <laughs> It does help, you know. Uh, I used to do a lot of arpeggios, you know. I'd, I'd figure out a, uh, a series of notes. I'd, if I, I'd like a phrase, right, or four notes, you know. I'd, I'd put it in major, you know, I'd do, it, I'd do it in whole steps and do it in minor thirds, do it in major thirds, you know, backwards. You know, just string a bunch of things together. And, uh, and that helped me quite a bit. Uh, you know, as I said, I learned solos. For me, the trick was I played as much as I could. Uh, I played along with records, you know. And uh, I spent a lot of time wasting time. In a certain way, pra you know, practicing. I, I have a bizarre, there's no system. I have no system. I just sit around and, and get something in my head and then work on it for a while. And then maybe the next day, if I was lucky, I'd work on it, you know. And uh, Somehow it would sneak into my playing. Uh, I try to practice things that are going to be practical. Um, certain licks, I was talking about earlier, certain licks or certain phrases only sound good in certain keys. I'll learn them in every key, you know, just to know it. But I, I have to stay aware that, that I'm really not going to play a certain thing down at the bottom of the horn because it sounds like crud, you know. Uh, playing with other saxophone players has helped me a lot. Playing with drummers, just tenor and drums, was a real good good tool for me. That's really kind of a saxophone thing. I don't know, you know, how well that works on other instruments, but that, you know, uh, that helped me a lot. <clears throat> and I also keep a notebook. Uh, I always write the date and and what I practiced, you know, or the ideas that I came up with. And uh, you publish it. <laughs> right. Um, the book is only one page long. So. <laughs> no, it's gotten kind of, uh, it's been a little thin lately. You know, I, I look back at it, you know, and I see like the last time was like two months ago, and I just, oh my God. Uh, as I said, I practice in spurts. Uh, there'll be a whole series of a few weeks where I'll really be hitting it, and then I stop. And I play, and, I, and other things come up. Uh, I should also say, right now in my life, uh, you know, my priority was always music, 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 you know, before everything. And uh, nothing else really mattered. And, and that's kind of turned around for me in the past uh, two or three years. So and it's not that it's taking a back seat, but it is taking a back seat a little bit. It's still very important to me, but I kind of found through trial and error that, uh, that the rest of my life direct, directly affects the way I play, you know, spiritually and mentally and... Uh, so I've been trying to keep, uh, you know, trying to stay healthy and keep a good balance, you know, on a spiritual and mental and physical level. And, uh, and then music fits in and it's a lot more healthy, you know. I'm just not into killing myself anymore. I, I, I tried that route and uh, it, it was, was not happy, you know. I sometimes played well, but I was very miserable. Thank you. Hi. 
Uh, yeah, why would have the Brecker Brothers never done a, a tour of the United States or anything? Where were you? <laughs> Probably too young. I mean, Maybe. in the recent years since I've been listening to the Brecker Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I used to live in Detroit, and I've never heard of any Brother Brothers ever coming to Detroit or anything, you know. Has uh, that ever happened, and when was the last time that it happened? We stay away from Detroit, no. <laughs> no, we, we, played, we have played Detroit. Uh, uh, we haven't toured in, in, a, in, a, in a good uh, two or three years, really, so I don't know where that puts you chronologically. Uh, uh, <laughs> when are you going to tour again? That's what I'm trying to say. I hope soon. Because uh, I've seen you by yourself like probably ten times, and I've seen Randy by himself like five times. And I've yeah. seen you all together. It's in the works. Uh, there's nothing definite planned. Uh, we needed to take a little bit of a, a break because we've been playing together for years, you know, and, uh, you know, just for, the, uh, for our own health, we wanted to just, you know, kind of do separate pro projects for a minute, which, you know, we've done and we're in the process of doing it. He's making an album right now, uh, and it's real good, and he and his wife are expecting a baby, and it's, you know, it's exciting things happening there. Uh, in the future, I, I really suspect we'll, you know, we'll do some touring and playing together, you know, because uh, I love to play with him. We have a, uh, I guess from b being brothers uh, and growing up playing in the bathroom together, uh, we, have, uh, we have some kind of weird intuitive uh, Communication. I don't. I never have to ask how he's going to phrase something. Like if we have to play a part, you know. I just. We can just play it right off, you know. And uh, I suspect Winton has that with Branford, you know. And who knows? Uh, 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 I'm trying to think of another. Bro Thank you. You catch my drift, right? Uh, it's Jimmy and Tommy Dorsey, right? <laughs> Uh, the question is, what was it like playing with Pat Metheny? And uh, the, the answer is, it was one of the best experiences I ever had. You know, we did a tour with Joni Mitchell together, and that's where we really found we had an affinity. And uh, I, since recorded with him and toured with him, and uh, we play really well together. There was talk about us doing something in Japan together over the summer. I don't know if it's going to crystallize, but I. Uh, I love his playing and, and his conception and, uh, and, and the maturity in his playing. You know, he's really a phenomenal musician. No. <laughs> uh, it, it hasn't come up lately. Uh, but I'd certainly, you know, I mean, if the, if the situation came up, I would love to do that, you know. Thank you. Hi. I was wondering what you had to say about James Taylor as a songwriter and musician. Okay, that's a, that's a yeah, that's a, actually a good question. It's you know, a couple of my favorite subjects. The question is, how do I feel about playing with James Taylor, and and how do I feel about Dave Sanborn? Uh, I respect James tremendously because he's a is a he's a very innately natural musician, extremely talented, uh, and creative. Uh, he's a he's a real brain in, in every way. Uh, and I liked the recording I did with him because he let us get involved in making up parts and, and determining where the music was going to go. And uh, whenever a musician does that, that you know, that uh, is in the kind of sales bracket that he's in, it's always it's it's fun. You know, it, it becomes real creative, and, and we enjoy it. As far as Dave Sanborn, he's one of my favorite living musicians, and I'm a, a complete fan of his. You know, a man can say more in one note you know, than, than a lot of people in, in 10. You know, he, uh, he just plays amazingly uh, well. Uh, he's a real voice, you know. There's, there's something very, um, I don't know the word. Uh, not another word I'm looking for. Uh, blank. Uh, he has a unique sound, you know, and that. Uh, a gorgeous way of playing lyrically uh, passionate, you know, and, uh, and you know, freaks me out. It's a real pleasure to stand next to him and listen to him play, and, and he's also pretty much my favorite player to play with in a section, because we have a real nice kind of way we, our, our sounds 
bond. You would think that they wouldn't blend, but they kind of blend real nicely, you know. I've learned a lot from him. Thank you. Uh, maybe let's play. Let's play.
as we were reaching the end of that. I, I, one thing I've always had trouble with is ending tunes. You know, getting a whole... I never know quite what to, to do to get a tune to end. I ran into that problem the other night when we were playing with steps, and we realized that none of us knew how to end it. Uh, we, had just finished rec we had finished recording it, and on the record it had faded. And we, you know, it was a regular fade, and we got to this concert without rehearsing, and we were all looking at each other, realizing we can't fade on stage. So it was a... Kind of a fiasco. We got out of it. Maybe we'll play one more tune. I think. Uh, I don't know what. Hey. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I last about a chorus and a half. You know. Let's do that. Let's do. Oil. Oil. Jesus. <laughs>
Pasa. This is another oldie but goodie. Uh, this is called Record Me, written by Joe Henderson. Joe Henderson, right here. Uh, where is it? Uh, one, two, uh, 